Welcome all to Riverside Online. Once again, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us. Until the day we can meet and do church face to face, we have the space to share in God's word and grow together as a church. If you are new to Riverside Online or wanting to engage with us, please click on the connect with us link on our website. Hope you enjoy the sermon. And if you have missed any of our previous sermons or want to catch up, please check out our YouTube channel, Riverside Community SA. Hey everyone, so we as a church have been going through the Sermon on the Mount and we have seen just how relevant God's Word has been to us through what we've been going through as a church and as a nation. And we've seen many kind of God incidence moments where God's Word has kind of punched through 2,000 years of history and become so alive and relevant to us. And once again, this week, I am amazed at His timing. And why do I say that? Well, we're over a hundred days into our lockdown here in South Africa. And while some businesses have opened up and while there are a few churches that have even opened up, we as a church have decided not to. And the primary reason amongst many others was that we knew the spike was still coming. And now this last week in Gauteng, in our part of South Africa, we have seen the spike come in but it doesn't feel like a spike with a rapid drop off on the other side if anything it feels like a tidal wave of infections that is moving across our part of the country and so for many people something that was kind of far out happening to other people out there is suddenly very close and very real to us And while maybe a few weeks or a few months ago, we were worried about our livelihoods and our businesses and the economy, many of us are starting to worry about our lives. And then we get to God's word and we're just going through the Sermon on the Mount, the sermon that Jesus preached 2000 years ago. We're going through it verse by verse, section by section, week by week. And yet we see God's impeccable timing because if you open up your Bible today and see what we're going to focus on, you're going to see that God wants to speak to us about our fears and our worries and our anxieties at the point where I believe our worries and our fears and our anxieties are at their peak. So God is amazing. Now, while this COVID season has definitely given us plenty to worry about, it's not the only things that are causing anxiety in your life. Maybe for some of you, you're anxious about being alone. Maybe some of you get anxious about social media, either because of the news coming up or you're seeing everybody else's highlights and you feel like your life is a constant low light and that causes you anxiety. Maybe these events are just causing you to feel like you're losing control and and that's causing you fears and anxieties. Maybe you have anxiety about losing a loved one or losing another loved one or maybe a sermon on anxiety is giving you anxiety and I understand that but let me get real with you for a second I I don't think that I tend to be an anxious person however over the last few weeks I have definitely felt the levels of worry in my life rise and my kids like many of all of yours are going back to school and that was never anything I ever had to worry about. And while yes, we send them with faith and with prayer and we trust all the systems and we trust all the people, suddenly there are new things to be anxious about there. And then I worry about our church and by our church, I mean you guys. I know that so many of you are feeling burnt out. So many of you are feeling bombarded, are getting worn down and worn out and are just slowly feeling your hope get eroded. And I worry about the unknowns. I worry about when can we meet again or when should we meet again and how long is that going to be and what does it mean for us as a church? And then like you, I worry about what this virus is doing to our nation what's coming out of our nation economically and politically, the lives of people we know. And and I'm also worried about what this is doing to our minds and our hearts and our souls. 
Now, this experience is probably different for every single one of you, but today we're going to find out that God the Father loves you so much that He's going to sit you down. He's going to sit me down and He's going to have a loving conversation with us about our fears and our anxieties. So let's dive right in. Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 onwards. And Jesus starts off saying this. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And I just want to stop there for a second because I don't know if that first line comes across a little bit trite. I mean, here are all these big things giving us real reasons to be anxious and worried and fearful. And here Jesus comes along and says, just don't worry. All right? I, I don't know if you've ever been angry and someone's come up to you, especially if they're a spouse and said, just stop being angry. So what has that done for your anger, right? Has it stopped your anger or has it fueled your anger? Or in this case, we've got so many reasons to, to cause us to lose our fear and our, sorry, to be afraid and to lose our faith. And then Jesus says, well, of course, he's got a lot more to say, but at this point he says, just do not worry. Now, anxiety has been a growing problem for us, even BC. And by BC, I mean before covid this has been a phenomenon that has been growing in our nation and actually growing across the world. And there are many complex reasons why this is happening, especially in our younger generations. But there are also many complex reasons why you on any given day may be experiencing fear and anxiety. And so just before we move any further, I want to speak about maybe four kinds of anxiety or four levels of anxiety, just so that we can locate ourselves in this message. And the, and the first one is this, that, that some of you are experiencing anxiety because of a genuine life-threatening situation. Now, I know this kind of sounds a bit contrived, but let's say your child starts running into the highway traffic. You are going to feel a spark of fear and anxiety in your body. That is not a moment to cast your burdens onto Jesus. That is not a moment to stop and meditate and start being grateful towards God for all the other good things in your life. That is a God-given impulse for you to act and go and save your child, right? So some of you are experiencing some appropriate levels of anxiety because of some of the very real situations that are true in your life right now. Then there's a second type of anxiety and some people are experiencing anxiety because of their own sin and their own shortcomings, bad decisions that they have made. And so for example, if someone's gambled away all their life savings and the house and the car and the washing machine, or to maybe think of another situation, someone's having an affair and cheating on their husband or their wife. Those kinds of people are going to be experiencing chronic anxiety because of what happens if I'm, find, if I'm found out and, and what are going to be the consequences to my family and my future. And so some people experience real chronic anxiety, which are simply connected not to daddy issues and you know, strange forces going on in the world around us, but they are simply a result of your sinful decisions. There may be a third type of anxiety some people are experiencing would be clinical anxiety, which is a genuine, debilitating physiological condition. This is a, a medical condition where someone who needs help in this area is going to need ongoing medical and psychological and spiritual help. And it's always good to know that there's still hope in those kinds of situations. And then a fourth kind of anxiety is where someone is experiencing fear and anxiety as a result of their lack of faith in God. And I think that is where Jesus is zoning in today. And yes, while kind of this fourth level lack of faith in God may be connected to some of the others, I just want to recognize that anxiety is complex and this single sermon is probably not going to be the magic pill that takes all of your anxiety away. However, Regardless of where you find yourself and regardless of your anxiety and your situations, here's what I'm going to ask you to do and here's what I'm praying for God to do. I'm going to ask you to be open to what God has to say to you today. 
And so I'm going to ask God to take everything that he's got in his word and because his word is living and active and because Jesus is alive and active and because his Holy Spirit is with me right now and with you right now, I'm going to ask him to take what he wants for you and to make it land for you in a very special, clear way. And so while other points may be less relevant to you and extremely relevant to other people, you can walk away today knowing that you've encountered God's voice in the middle of your fear and anxiety. So let's read the whole passage together. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 onwards. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the fields grow. They do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Now, you need to know that when Jesus was preaching these words, he wasn't at the Santon Convention speaker. He wasn't speaking to businessmen with three cars and a holiday home and RAs and investments telling them, don't worry about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat tomorrow. Jesus was largely speaking into an agrarian culture, people who were largely poor under the oppressive Romans who were taxing them at extreme levels. These were people who, for the most part, lived a hand-to-mouth existence, spending their days trying to get enough supplies for that day. So these were people for whom, what am I going to eat tomorrow, or what am I going to wear tomorrow, was a very real concern, as it may be for you right now too. And so maybe knowing that, you might think to yourself, well, that's quite cruel of Jesus to say to people who are struggling in this very real way, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about tomorrow. So to help us to get to what Jesus does mean, let's start off with what he doesn't mean. First of all, Jesus is not saying, do not plan. He's also not saying that if you think and plan about the future, that you have no faith. He's also not saying that if you had an RA or a savings plan, he's not saying do not invest. And I know these things for a fact because God is consistent with his whole word. And there is plenty of wisdom that comes out of the whole Bible encouraging us as far as we are able to do these very things. So Jesus doesn't mean those things. He's also not saying just live your life with reckless abandon in the name of faith and and make poor decisions in the name of Jesus and the name of not worrying. So if he's not saying those things, what is he saying? He's saying, do not worry. Do not worry. So yes, plan. Yes, think. Make wise decisions. Yes, but be crippled by worry. No. So I want to talk about four handles that Jesus gives us coming out of this text that can help every single one of us navigate some of the fears and worries and concerns that we have at the moment. And the first handle he gives us is this. We worry about what we are most invested in. We worry about what we are most invested in. Now, some of you are saying right now, well, that sounds familiar. In fact, I listened to your sermon last week, Steve, and that sounds like one of your major points from last week, and you would be 100% correct. So what's going on here? Well, what is the first word of the passage that we read today? If you pick up your Bible, first word of verse 25 is, therefore, 
And so whenever you see, this is just kind of like Bible hack. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to ask what it is there for. Ha ha ha. So therefore is connected to the previous verse where Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, do not worry. And so Jesus is highlighting that for some of us, our anxiety comes from a place of having put someone or something in the place of God in our lives. And because I love and I trust and I obey this idol in my life, and because I look to this thing for ultimate meaning and value and purpose and joy and life and love, when this thing that I've idolized becomes threatened, of course I'm going to be crippled by anxiety. And so here's how this works. And we actually had a conversation about this with our life group on our uh, Zoom meeting on Wednesday evening. But when we have good things in our lives, right, we are allowed to biblically and as Christians, we are allowed to enjoy them and to desire them. And the Greek word for desire, and I don't like, this is not to like impress you with my Greek, but you'll see the connection now. The Greek word for desire and a good God-given desire is thumia. Thumia. But when this good thing and this good desire becomes a God thing, it moves from being a thumia to an epithumia. An epithumia. It is an inflamed desire. And Timothy Keller, who speaks just so well and clearly, spoke about him last week as well, about idols in our lives. He says, when we've got an idol like this in our lives, we don't have just ordinary levels of desire for it. We have these epi levels of desire for it. We become bipolar regarding our idol. And now he's not making psychological or psychiatric evaluation. This is what he means by that. What he means is because something is epithemia in my life, it means when I like it, I don't just like it, I epi like it. Meaning I love it, I'm devoted to it. Or when I enjoy it, I don't just enjoy it at appropriate God-given levels, I epi enjoy it and I find the meaning and purpose and significance in it. But then, of course, when I, when I lose it, I don't just become sad. I become epi sad. I, I'm devastated and I'm broken by that loss. Or when I worry about my idol, I don't just worry about it at appropriate levels. I epi worry about it and it cripples me. And that anxiety pulls the rug out under the, out under the feet of my life. And so Jesus is holding up this idea as a red flag and a warning for us because we worry about what we are most invested in. But then he moves us to a second handle just for us to help navigate our fear and our anxiety. And it is this. God doesn't just want to save you. He wants to care for you. God doesn't just want to save you. He wants to care for you. Now, I know for many people coming to Jesus is like getting a Get out of hell free card. And, and, and once we've trusted in Jesus, the prayer that I prayed 5, 10, 15, 30 years ago, I kind of say to God, well, well, thanks for that. I couldn't get up on the cross the way Jesus did. Thank you for getting me out of hell and into heaven. But I'll tell you what, Jesus, I'll take it from here. I will look after my life from this point onwards. Now, something I, I regularly speak about at Riverside is that our Father in heaven is our how much more Father, how much more Father. And Jesus brings us up again and he says, listen, if God cares for budgies, how much more is he going to care for you? Or if our Father in heaven cares for the flowers and the grass of the field, how much more will he care for you? Listen to these incredible verses, Isaiah 49 verses 15 to 16. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? And though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Listen to Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? 
And so these scriptures are saying, if, if God did the greater thing, will he not give us the lesser thing? If God gave us his son, will he not care for us ongoingly as a loving and good father will? You see, because God doesn't just want to save you, he wants to care for you. Think about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is coaching us to understand this as we pray the Lord's Prayer every single day. Give us today what I need today, my good father. And so whether you've got lots or whether you've got less, we are designed by God to come to him and recognize him as the one who cares for us. And so I think the perspective shifts that we are being challenged on is something like this. If everything does ultimately fall on you and if you believe in the bottom of your heart that God saved you, but now you've got to take it from here. And if every responsibility falls finally on you and you alone, then yes, yes, be crippled by fear. Because that is a burden that we were never designed to bear. But if you've got a father in heaven who cares for you and who is even there to help us navigate even our own failures, then let us cast our burdens onto Jesus because he cares for you. Now, this doesn't mean sit on your couch all day playing PlayStation because God is going to magically make money appear in your bank accounts. Right? Although many of you probably wish that was how it worked. See, God still calls us to obedience. God still calls us to wise stewardship of our talents and our gifts and our abilities and our opportunities and our relationships. He still calls us to maturity. He calls us to wisdom and self-control. And if some of the situations that you're in right now are as a result of your disobedience, and the Bible actually speaks very clearly about laziness, that's a different story. But here's the thing. We need to worry about obedience, but leave the results up to my father. We worry about obedience and maturity and stewardship, but we leave the burden of the results up to God because he is a father who cares for us. And when we do that, we release ourselves from the crushing burden of believing that everything is up to me. We've got a third handle to help us navigate worry and anxiety. And it is quite simply this. Number three, worry doesn't work. Worry doesn't work. Some of you need to hear that. I heard somebody once say that worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Now, as I was writing this down, I thought that if I was preaching in front of the church, I would get some sympathetic chuckles at that point in time. So this is the, your cue to give me some sympathetic chuckles and encourage me and show me that you're still with me. But so Jesus says, okay, fine. Okay, you're stressed. You've got the interview. You've got the exams coming up. You've got the challenging circumstances in your life. You've got bills. I get it. But he says, listen, just think about it for five seconds. When has worry ever helped you? When has worry ever added to your life? When has worry ever added time and given you the time that you think you need? And the answer is, well, worry has actually taken from your life. And if anything, worry has shortened your life. There are a number of studies that show that possibly up to 75% of doctor visits are connected to stress and anxiety. I don't know if you've ever had to Google some uh, symptoms on the internet and often what comes up quite close to the top is the Mayo Clinic. And so Dr. Charles Mayo from the Mayo Clinic, he says this, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands and the whole nervous system. And though I have never known a man who died of overwork, I have known a lot who died of worry. Now maybe think about it this way. Most of the things you worry about will never happen. And now, just to let you know, I'm preaching to myself right now. Think about all the things you've worried about that actually never happened. And so we worry about the thousands of things that may happen tomorrow, when in fact there are only going to be two or three of those things that are going to happen tomorrow. Or we worry about A, B, and C, but what happens tomorrow is D, E, and F. And so either way, whether we did or did not worry about it, we are still going to encounter not A, B, and C, but D, E, and F tomorrow. And so Jesus says, don't worry about the 997 things that 
aren't going to happen tomorrow, but rely on my strength and wisdom and presence tomorrow when you do encounter the two or three things that are going to happen. See, worry doesn't work. It it doesn't add to your life. It won't change your circumstances. Charles Spurgeon, who was quite acquainted with clinical depression, he actually said this. He says, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but only empties today of its strength. Worry doesn't work. So let's move to the fourth handle that God gives us through his word today. And that is, do God's work, God's way, in God's strength and with God's provision. Do God's work, God's way, in God's strength and with God's provision. Provisions. Stephen, where did you get that from? The very famous verse, verse 33 in this text. Seek first, put first God's kingdom and all these other things that you worry about will be given to you because your father knows you need them. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this verse preached before. If you've memorized this verse, it's a wonderful verse and a a wonderful promise. But this verse doesn't mean putting God's kingdom first means go to church every now and again and pray. Often that's the first kind of thing that comes into our mind and then everything else is going to come right. Now, while I do not have time to expand on this, I do think there's something to be said for God's rhythms that he gives us for our life, our our weekly and our monthly and our annual rhythms. Where God plans for us to experience the rhythm of rest, going into work and then back to rest. Where God plans the rhythms of Sabbath for us and the rhythms of gathering with fellow believers who are there to walk with you and encourage you. The rhythms of coming before God's word and worshiping him and fellowshipping him and being on mission with him and finding purpose with God's work in this world. The the rhythms of abiding with Jesus. All of those are rhythms that are designed to add to your life, not to take from them. But having said that, Putting God's kingdom first doesn't necessarily mean going to eight prayer meetings a week. Rather, what it means is discovering the lordship of Jesus and the presence and kingdom of Jesus in every single part of your life. So you start to discover God's kingdom in your work. You start to discover God's kingdom in your family, even in your recreation. You start to discover God's kingdom and meaning and purpose in your life as he moves you forward towards greater purpose in this world. And as you start to align more of your life according to God's kingdom, because you have placed Jesus at the point of primacy in your life, and he is an active, effective God working in this world, as you align your your rest and your work and your play and and your, your religious activities and spiritual input in your life with God's kingdom, you're going to start seeing God at work. You're going to start seeing God working in you and with you and through you. And you're going to start noticing how the Father is caring for you in this very place, providing everything you need because He knows you need it. Notice in the Lord's Prayer, what comes first is, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. And then that's followed by, give us today what I need. That's what Jesus means when he says, put the kingdom of God first and and all these other things will be added unto you. In other words, align yourself to Jesus, what he is doing, and then see how the Father cares for you and provides for you. So as we start wrapping up, I've just got to say that the answer to a life of worry and anxiety is not a trouble-free life. In fact, Jesus clearly said, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. Now, we don't make that into a meme. We don't make that into a t-shirt and a bumper sticker, but it is a very real truth that we experience every single day. But the answer to our worry is to walk this troubled life with the God who took my anxiety upon himself. The God who took the cause of my anxiety, my fears and my failures and my shortcomings and my sins upon himself, as well as the the shortcomings and sins of the world and the people around me. And so that God who experienced victory on the cross through his death and resurrection walks with me in this troubled world. And as a result of walking with this God and the love that I have with the Father, I get to walk in this troubled world knowing that my status and my identity doesn't come from my failures or my successes. 
but rather comes from the fact that when my Father in Heaven looks at me, He doesn't see me as this needy, pathetic person or a failure. Rather, He sees someone who is whole, who He loves fully. In fact, He loves me and enjoys me as much as He loves and enjoys His own Son, Jesus. And that is the scandalous truth of the Gospel. It's got nothing to do with my performance. And so I can be secure in that. And then finally, my security comes from not necessarily knowing the future, but walking with the one who does control the future. So I would like to pray for us. And and I want to really invite you into this prayer with your unique set of circumstances. Because there are so many things going on right now in, in the world and in our country and in your life. And so the best starting place for us all after hearing God's word is to respond to him in faith and trust and to bring our burdens to him. So pray with me. Father, I want to thank you that you are a father who saves and you are a father who cares for us. And and you care about our salvation, but you also care about our concerns and our anxieties. And I want to thank you that we can cast our burdens onto your capable and broad shoulders, Jesus, as you bore our burdens on the cross and carry them for us. And right now, I want to ask Holy Spirit, who is present with us, that you would minister and bring your peace and your freedom right into our place of fear and anxiety. Father, I want to bring before you our beautiful country, We want to bring before you our leaders. And I know that our our nation is a source of anxiety for so many of us. As we are worried about the political and economic forces at play. So Father, we lift our nation up to you. We lift our leaders up to you and we ask for your favor upon us. Father, we want to bring those on the front lines to you. We want to pray for doctors and and nurses and and teachers. And I I even think about those people who serve us in the grocery stores, people who are literally exposing themselves daily in order to serve us. I'm going to pray for your love and protection over them. Father, we bring our kids to you as, as I know that so many parents are anxious about our kids going back to school and Father, again, we pray for your presence and protection upon our families in this time. Father, we want to bring your church to you. And I don't only think of Riverside, but of course I think about our church. That we would see more and more of you uniting us in spite of so much fear. And that you would bring hope and faith to our lives. Father, I know that your people are worn out and are feeling battered. And I pray that the life of Jesus would be revealed among us as, as a real source of life and strength. Jesus, we literally, we look to you to be our daily bread. And Father, I also know that there are hundreds of reasons that I can't even think of creating anxiety in our lives. And so in the midst of all of that, give us eyes to see you, your presence, Jesus. Clear the fog of our fears so that we can see that you are with us and you are for us, that we do not need to fear evil because you are with us and that you would heal us. So right now, we choose to trust you more. We choose to trust you with our challenges, our faith, and our anxiety and our fears. And lastly, Father, I pray that your people would be a peaceful and a blessing presence to our anxious world as you bless us so that we can be a blessing to them. And we pray all of this, Lord, in your mighty name. Amen. If you managed to join us on Sunday morning, we wanted to carve out a special opportunity for us to pray with you and pray for you. And so we will have leaders and some of our prayer team available to come alongside you as you cast your burdens onto Jesus in prayer. If you are on YouTube, check out the Zoom link in the video description or below the video on our website as we join in prayer together. God bless you this week.